Hi, welcome back. A uh, little shop update and also I went to the Emo trade show this week, which is the largest manufacturing equipment trade show in the world and is conveniently located in Hanover, which is a, a four to eight hour train ride from me. So I went in the morning to the trade show by train, attended the trade show from nine to 18 o'clock and then went back the same day. Usually if you go to such a trade show, you should at least plan two days, but because I was a little bit pressed for time, I just could manage to go one day and still was absolutely worthwhile it. So if you can go to a trade show in your region, do it. So didn't take any video at all because that's a little bit tricky on the trade show usually. And also I was there because I wanted to look at things for my shop, but I took about nine pictures in total. So let's quickly look at those. Since I was speed running the trade show basically in one day from nine to eight to 18 o'clock in the evening, uh, I had to be very specific at what I looked at. And most of it was either tooling, work holding or manual machines. So I stopped by the guys from FPS, which do, they build new machines in the FP1 and FP3 size and also FP4 size machines as manual and CNC machines. And the FPS 300M, which you see here in the picture, is a machine that at some point in my life I might probably own it. It's basically the FP1 that I have just in an updated version. This is the late Deckel FP1 active machine basically. Uh, it's very expensive, but it's also a very nice machine. Then I stopped by Weiler because I'm still looking for a manual lathe. Weiler Primus v VCD, which uh, this machine doesn't have a gearbox for the spindle anymore. It just has a big honking motor and a VFD, but it has a gearbox for the for threading and power feeding. They also have a version with basically a electronic lead screw, but that drives the price of the machine up quite a bit. Then I had a Weiler E30 demoed to me. This is basically a CNC machine that you can run completely manual with the hand wheels. And the the way they they solve the operating a, a CNC machine manually and in, including the manual aspect into it is, is really clever. They can you can, for example, when you run a thread repair, you just put it into threading mode. It starts to thread endless. It, it runs the threading cycle endlessly and then you just adjust your infeed manually with the hand wheel until you, until you, you cleaned up the thread again. For example, if you have a weld build up on a thread. Also picking up existing threads is super simple. Uh, guy, the, the, the guy explaining the machine and the control to me took himself hmm, half an hour? Qu quite a bit of time for, for just random drop by and asking for a machine. So quite a neat machine, um, not my price class. Uh, ran by Schaublin. Uh, Schaublin 102N VM, which is basically the last manual tool room lathe that they built with power feed and I might be mildly in love. This is an incredible nice lathe. A friend of mine has one. Um, not my price class but oh man I'm, I might be in love with it. It's, it's smaller than my Emco but weighs about <laughs> the same or a little bit more with the cast on the, on the carriage here, on the, on the frame. Um, then I saw the Micro 5 CNC mill, which is now belonging to Chiron. It's basically a tiny five axis milling machine. Uh, they now have an option for the rotary table spinning up to 5000 rpm so you could use it as a lathe with a turning tool in the milling spindle and it also has a gripper to do second side operations. Uh, on the older machines this uh, the bellow around the spindle head was a black flexible neoprene material which 
made the whole machine look really nice and now they went for this uh, white trash bag optic which a weird choice um, random rotary table surface grinder Amada had their CNC profile grinding machine optical profile grinder which is a really interesting machine if, if you want to know the kinematics and, and what this machine is Google for Amada DPG 150 uh, you will find a pretty good YouTube video on this machine and it's a really interesting machine it's a little bit um, they are becoming more and more obsolete but they have it seems like they have their place and people like them uh, Jintac this is a Taiwanese company building all sorts of spin fixtures and spin indexers and punch grinding fixtures and these are really interesting my punch grinder that I have is a rebatched Jintac and the quality is superb so I might getting at some point in time a second one especially because they have a version with just a flat plate as shown here in the picture with threaded holes that you can bolt things to which is very nice Hemo, which is a Swiss company building uh, all sorts of work holding applications. Um, I just looked at their self centering vices and this long uh, multi station vice, which has grinding vice quality. Really nice. Oh, and I saw Top Coon, which is the mascot of OSG. It's really nice. And that's already all pictures that I had for my trade show visit taking pictures in the trade hall is technically prohibited and many of the exhibitioners themselves also have signs up that they don't want either pictures or videos from the taken and um, it's it's good practice to ask if you can take a photo so that's that and that's also the reason why there are not too many pictures uh, I was also met up with a bunch of uh, Instagram machinists. I also met up with a bunch of machinists from Instagram and dropped by the current booth to <laughs> to to eat to eat a pretzel and meet Marv. So that's that. That's the that's the trade show visit. If you can, if you can make it to a professional trade show, even if you are a hobbyist, don't pay the entry price. Go, go on Google and Google for Ticket Emo 2023 and chances are about 100% that you will get a free ticket without much hassle. So don't, don't pay the entry price. That's just, uh, I don't know why they even ask for money because it's a trade show. The many things that you will see there are not relevant for most of us because like hobbyists and small shop owners might not buy a half a million euro CNC mill and basically all the CNC milling machines are shower cabins with a spindle also mildly interesting but but the weirder things or the more more uh, manual side of things is quite interesting to see what's out there so go to trade shows go in the, into the public petri dish that's called a trade show. One little trick or tip about repeating machine maintenance is this box with these two sponges in here. I learned this from a toolmaker friend and uh, I liked it quite a bit so I adopted it in my own shop. What this is, is this is basically just two kitchen sponges with the scrubby side and soft side and they are just in a box and they are soaked with your favorite light rust preventive oil. One of the non-drying rust preventive oils. It's just a very thin oil. Uh, you could also use like a 68 weight whey oil. And the way I use this is when I shut down the shop for the day, I have cleaned everything, my machines are clean, bench is clean. I take these sponges uh, there are two colors in here a red one and a green one green one is for clean stuff and the red one is for a little bit dirtier stuff and I just and I just wipe down machine surfaces bare metal surfaces with the oily sponge sometimes if I feel like it's a little bit 
grungy, I'll take the rough side of the sponge and give it a quick wipe like this. Just a little bit of a scrub and wipe down the oil. Also here on the hand wheels. Just everything, the handle back here of the power feed. Also up here the machine surface where the gauge block stack up can be placed or the graduated dial for the angle setting of the vertical head. Just wiping down everything with the oily sponge. This removes any built up dust and dirt on these surfaces. Gives them a nice polish, prevents them from rusting. And well, just making everything a little bit cleaner and giving it a good oil coat, which prevents long-term corrosion. And over time, when you do this repeatedly, um, your machines get basically cleaner and cleaner. <laughs> uh, if you choose an oil that's not attacking paints, you can also just mildly wipe down the painted surfaces if you feel like it. Also, device. And I would do the same on the lathe, wiping down the tool post, the solid tool post, the cross slide top, uh, the outside of the chuck, the face of the chuck, things like that. I would not use this on the machine ways because when you wipe down everything with it, you pick up some grit and grime and you would distribute this over the machine ways. So this is a no-go on machine ways, but on every exposed bare metal surface, I think this is a pretty good way to prevent rust and keep your machines quite clean and prevent any rust on surfaces. And the red one I would use for example on a tool and cutter grinder to wipe down the table. After I have removed most of the grit with a rag of course. So that's uh, wiping down the milling machine. And when I'm done with, with the sponges, I just take a piece of paper towel and wipe down very lightly all the excess from, from the exposed surfaces, just so there are no pools of oil on it. When I start working tomorrow here, when I get back in the shop after a nice eight hours of sleep, probably, I will do, if I need the mill, I would wipe down it anyways but I just don't want the machine to be sitting in oil. Okay, and that's just a very quick few minute procedure on a machine to, to keep it clean and rust free. I will do the same on tooling that I, that I do give into storage that I put into my shelf, for example. For example, the faceplate down there and the indexing discs get the same treatment when I hang them there. I just wipe them down with one of the sponges, wipe down the excess oil and I know that I will not have any problems. If I put something in deep storage like the Moore rotary table, I will spray it down with, with this stuff because then I can drop it in an ocean and be pretty confident that I will not end up with any rust buildup on it. A little comfort improvement here in the shop. I used to have the overarm support for long mill arbors and the overarm support for the indexing head crammed under the lathe and the milling machine and behind the drill press and that was rather annoying. So I put up a, a board on the wall and I'm just hanging these accessories here. Also made some dovetail shaped pieces of wood here. So the, the tail stock for the indexing head can slide on here and also the Will you please go away? And also the the support bearing for using long middle arbors can go on here. Also the faceplate for the indexing head hangs here and the the indexing disc for the indexing head. On things that you you're hanging on a screw, I put some shrink tube over the, the shank of the screw so it doesn't scratch a precision bore like on the inside of these indexing discs. Little trick. So, uh, accessory wall for the decal. 
Also, I'm slowly banning all spiral hoses for the air guns out of my shop because those always get tangled up into a giant knot and are a pain in the you know what. So I purchased these ball swivels from Muffa. I'm going to put the link down in the description. And also I, I ordered some relatively flexible uh, straight hose and then just making uh, like a, a 1 meter 50 long piece of hose that goes to to a socket and I don't ha even have a connector uh, a, a removal connector between the air gun and the hose anymore just one of these two ear clamps which don't get snagged like a regular hose clamp with the warm drive and so far I'm liking it this is this doesn't coil up or anything I just have this this uh, one loop of hose going down to the floor and I don't hate it so far. Looks like this when used just whoop whoop. And I have some reach over there too, so uh, good enough. I have the same on the lathe now and I'm slowly replacing all of my spiral uh, hoses like that. So I horse traded with a friend and got this vacuum pump, which I want to use for vacuum work holding. Usually I'm using this when I use my vacuum chuck. Uh, compressed air goes in here, noise comes out here, and a little bit of vacuum comes out here, or, well, goes in here. <laughs> uh, this is a Venturi valve. These are a very cost efficient way to get some vacuum, but also highly inefficient and very loud and uh, in general very annoying and this one and also they are they take well compressed air and compressed air is the most expensive form of energy in a shop and my compressor when it runs takes two and a half kilowatts I think so two and a half kilowatt per hour that's quite significant I'm running off um, solar power during the day but still doesn't doesn't feel right so got this this vacuum pump here which only takes 250 watts 0.25 kilowatts running continuously and these are made to run continuously compared to my compressor which gets extremely hot if i run it continuously because it's not made for it currently i'm setting it up to be usable here is a this is a air filter from automotive or truck things it uh, goes on here for for the exhausted air because this is an oil lubricated system and you don't want the air that comes with the that comes out here to go in the environment unfiltered because there is some oil mist in it and this filter should catch it. Also under this piece of masking tape this is the intake for the so this is the vacuum side. Um, still figuring out which way I want to connect to my vacuum chucks. But probably I'm going over a KF flange and then to a 6 or 8 millimeter hose because all my vacuum fixtures use a 6 millimeter hose. Both my flat vacuum fixture for plate work and this custom made vacuum fixture that goes on my Aerovo chuck for one specific customer part. Uh, those just take 6 millimeter hose. That's that. I uh, already have the KF connector for this for this flange here just need to do a little bit of machining but I guess I will put this in the next CNC machine video when I put all of this together. Most people probably know this already but for the two people that have never seen it let's let's talk about um, riv nuts, riveting nuts. These are very similar to pop rivets. You use an arbor, you pull on it then the material here buckles up and rivets this nut in place. These are mostly used to create a, a machine thread in a piece of sheet metal and give you some thread engagement compared to trying to thread into the sheet metal. There are also other options like welding nuts or uh, flow drilling and then form tapping, but these are very low effort and low entry cost solution for getting a thread. 
Problem is you need a, a tool to seat them, to, to rivet them in place, like a, um, a manual rivet nut setter or pneumatic one, or I think they make attachments for, for a cordless drill now they, that do the same. But being the cheapskate that I am, I'm not buying one of the plier style ones because those top out at around an M5 riv nut, especially if these are uh, if they are steel like these ones, M6 often is already a bear to to rivet in place. Then you need a ratcheting a riv gun or a pneumatic one. There is an alternative that's a little bit more hacky, uh, but doesn't cost you very much. All you need is a machine screw with the thread of your rivet nut, a high strength nut, like uh, I'm using a, a flange nut from, from setup screws from the milling machine because these are heat treated and have about double the length of a regular nut. You screw this on, then a heavy duty washer just to spread out the load. And normally now people put the rivet nut on here and use a wrench on here to contact the torque and a second wrench on here to pull the screw through the rivet nut. That doesn't work too well. Usually you end up just unscrewing everything from the rivet nut because there is uh, so much friction in the whole system that it just does not work well. But being a collector of fine machine parts, I'm using the cheapest axle bearing that I found in a drawer, which has this <laughs> a little bit oversized screw that I'm using, turned a little bushing, no precision required whatsoever. Just uh, through hole and centering the axle bearing on here. This goes on here. Make sure that the boss on this bushing is shorter than the overall thickness of the bearing. This goes on here and you're good to go. Thread your rivet nut on here and you're good to go. This is this now you can rivet in place. Let's let's go to a piece of sheet metal and squeeze it. I have a hole in this piece of sheet metal already. So this whole assembly with the axle bearing goes in here. Oh, it'd be nice if it fit. So you put this in place, you, you finger tighten the nut against the rivet nut back here get your ratcheting wrench or whatever you want to use to turn the nut in here. The Allen key here provides the counter torque and then you just start to crank away and as you can see the axle bearing stops any of the torque of the, of the nut going into the rivet nut. We're just you putting axial force into the rivet nut. Then once you tighten it, the, these have kind of a hard, a hard spike in torque once they are fully seated and you will notice it. And then you just untension the nut back here and you can unscrew the, uh, the setter tool. Then the nut is seated without any hassle and without having to buy a fairly heavy duty riveting tool for M6 or larger. Especially since I also have M12 rivet nuts here and a riveting tool for that gets quite expensive. And really I don't need a riveting uh, rivet nut setting tool very often. <laughs> I need it twice a year when I build an electric cabinet and I'm not going to purchase a separate tool for that. So. This is my solution for that. Okay, here again is a side view, this time inside of a hollow square tubing. And as you can see, the rivet nut starts 
to go a little bit to one side but the more you tighten it down the more it straightens out itself just because of the tension of the screw releasing the nut and unscrewing the tool it's less efficient than using a real rivnut tool but well it works this is the less glamorous side of building machines being on the floor adding some threads to the side panel of a machine And basically this is half of the time when you build special machines as a day job. <laughs> and these four threads are there to mount a subplate to hold all the pneumatic components on my CNC milling machine like the input pressure regulator, the uh, a distributor for the compressed air and also the minimum quantity lubrication system that I am using on this machine. The way I'm mounting this plate is keyholes. Uh, this allows the screws to stay in their threads and you just slide the plate over the keyholes and lock it in place. This is a very nice little feature when you mount stuff. It's a little bit more effort to machine but a little bit less painful when you mount it and you can just put all the screws in and hang the plate over it so little little tip there So the company Deckel did something that was more common in the past. They had a, a technical bulletin, like a newsletter, that they sent out like four times a year to customers. And they also made this nice folder so you could bind them up as a book. And these technical bulletins, uh, there is an English version of these. At least some of them exist in the English version, but this is all German. Uh, these are a source of interesting ideas and hints and modifications to machines. It's basically uh, printed out internet, but from the days before internet. This, it, it started in 1955 and I think the last one were around 1970. Let's look, let's have a look. The latest one was 2 1974 so they did this a fairly long time and a viewer sent me this folder and i'm really grateful for that because these are rather hard to get a hold of there is you can you can find them on the internet if you search a little bit in a scanned form as pdf file i will not link to them but you will find them if you google for deckel technische mitteilungen technische mitteilung meaning technical bulletin so let's have a look in it. Some, some of them are interesting and since they are all in German, uh, I will put in a little bit of commentary. I'm not going into everything because some of it is extremely esoteric, like this application here. This is broaching an internal spiral into a workpiece to mold uh, parts like this. So things like that would be posted in these bulletins either by Deckel employees developed techniques they also showed new machines in these bulletins and readers and customers of Deckel could also send in ideas to be published in here so it's really like a bulletin board on the internet uh, tool grinding was a big deal or uh, generating cams on the Deckel S1 tool cutter grinder Using the duplicator or engraver mills was always a big deal. This is interesting. This was a, a chapter about single flute cutters or D-bits to be either used on a manual milling machine or on a copy milling machine. 
So they, they go into the material. Most of them were high-speed steel back in the day, but also already carbide. And here they state that carbide should be used in high-strength steel, cast steel, uh, cast iron, and also heat-treated steels for um, for basically hard milling. They go into the different shapes. We uh, flat with radius, conical with radius. The edge prep for different materials so they last longer, especially when you use carbide. Uh, back in the day the carbide was not as fine grain as it is today and you did definitely need a cutting edge chamfer or even a radius. So things like that would be in these bulletins. Some of it is very specific to machines, so I'm basically going over it a little bit quicker because it's uh, not of general interest, I guess. So yeah, this 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 is very common in these bulletins. Um, here, for example. Deckel started to sell a different spindle for my tool and cutter grinder, which could go to 15,000 RPM, doubling the speed. And they would give just a rundown of how to change what to change on the machine, switch out the spindle and the pulley. And they even gave you a new, a new sign for the speeds that the machine would, would reach with that spindle. Some work examples for the copy milling machine, for the KF series machine that could use the model milling or, or geometric generation feature to mill patterns like this or shapes like this without a model. You could go directly from a drawing to, to this shape and then use the mirror image attachment to create the other side of the, of the mold and, or of the pattern. The illustrations in these bulletins are really really nice. They are well well edited pictures. At some point they changed the indexing head on the Deckel FP1 and 2 head milling machine added the 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 24 position direct indexing discs got an update to be adjustable and then they well they did a write down on on what it's used for and had some application pictures of course this was not available from the beginning this is the right angle milling head as you can see with a large wheel cutter machining the inside of this casting Many, many articles about building patterns for the copy milling machines. That was, that was high-end technology back in the day. This is, this is a rather interesting article. This goes into detail how to machine a, a pocket with, uh, well, a square pocket with conical sides and sharp internal corners like this on the FP1 milling machine. And it has some limitations uh, to reach in, but basically you rough it out in steps according to layout lines. Then you set it up on the sides, cut the cut the side walls. You you cut a, a witness line in here so you can get the angle, and then you set it up at a compound angle like here. And then you can machine this internal corner. This only works with sphere um, with with pockets that have a draft if you cannot reach in there with with an end mill you have to use a very long d bit with a v tip and you can clean out the internal edges like that and you create a pocket with a sharp here we have the back then in 1963 new tackle fp3 milling machine uh, fp3 it got later renamed to fp33 because it is a very different layout configuration than the regular Deckel FP machines. They came out with a normal uh, standard configured Deckel FP3 later, 
but until then it was called FP, FP3, then renamed to FP33. On these machines you have a slant bed with the table moving side to side on a very heavy base casting on the floor. The C-axis is this entire column in the back here moving up and down and the Y-axis is the RAM moving in and out. And you might notice that this machine came with a crane, which is very useful because it's a machine for uh, heavy work pieces. And on such a large machine, all the accessories are all so darn heavy. So, and these were always very delightful to look at because they had some work example always lined up, like machining a very large aluminum piece clamped directly to the table, milling head at an angle, or using the one of the larger rotary tables that they supplied. I think this is a 500 millimeter rotary table. I'm machining this large, large piece with Wolhaupt a UPA4 boring head. We're down here doing some plate work also with boring head. This machine also had a universal table that could be tilted, rotated and knotted to machine artwork to held pieces like that. Uh, what would be a tackle machine without a ton of accessories like a double swivel head? This could rotate side to side and also not front and back even with a quill. Same here. Also came in a high speed head variant, two axis adjustable. The precision boring head to do jig boring work and a jig grinding head. This is basically the jig grinding head of a Deckel FP2, just with different mounting flange to adapt it to the FP33. More jig grinding. The slotting head also came in a version for this machine. Very heavy duty horizontal milling application with with a stack up of cutters to machine this, this casting in one go. Uh, horizontal boring. This machine also had a quill on the horizontal axis. This is, by the way, a 50 taper machine. So not the stinky 40 taper like the normal Dackel machines. This is 50 taper. Uh, heavy horizontal milling. And here even, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is machining the table of a Deckel FP1 or 2 facing it down. They often showed machining of components that belong to Deckel machines in their demo pictures, but I'm not sure if this is actually the way they machined them in production or if this is just a photo op for these brochures, because in reality these tables were planed. Maybe they just roughed them and then had them planed. I don't know. But I suspect that these are just photo ops for, for these brochures. So then blazing high tech in 1964, indexable face mill. They also gave you an idea about the cutting diameter and which one to use on which machine. The 75 millimeter face mill is the only one suitable for my mill and smaller, of course. And the 152 millimeter face mill only was allowed on the FP3 machine or larger. So, and we have an entire chapter about jig grinding on either the dedicated jig borer jig grinder or on the tool room mills. Here shown on an FP2LB, which is the long bed variant. So this is the Deckel FP2LB long bed variant. And as you can see, when you want to use different attachments in front here, you just ro rotate the mill head 90 degrees and push it back on the ram to make room in front here for the accessory, like the chick grinding head or the uh, slotting head, for example. Uh, that was also always very useful on the larger machines. Yeah, tons of examples. At some point they came out with a, with a servo hydraulic system for the, the 
copy milling machines for the tracer mills and here they are demonstrating it roughing out the steel mold from a pattern and judging by the size of this guy and the mill these these kf machines are not small if you see one in real they are really beefy machines and the work pieces they put on them <laughs> are quite impressive well this is the long bad variant of the of the kf machine a kf lb machine or the the table is stationary so you could place extremely heavy plates and, and molds on it as shown here too very very large scale mold this uh let's see this is a this is a mold out of steel 3.7 liters of steel removed uh, 6.8 hours time of roughing with a uh, high speed steel end mill and index carbide end mill pre-finishing with a d-bit 12 hours and fin final finishing with a d-bit 24 hours so that, that was quite the workout uh, this, this is this is for example one of the uh, releases where they showed ideas from customers this for example this is a small air motor running with a belt a small spindle and this is mounted to the circle uh, divider attachment for the mill so you could use this to mill any desired radius by just adjusting the diameter and then you had your small milling machine going on an arc and this was sent in by Manfred Bayer and Günther Klaus uh, out of Göppingen more copy mill this is interesting here they are thread milling using the Deckel KF machine as you can see this is basically the same process as on a modern CNC mill doing thread milling going in a spiral path with a tool shaped like the the thread pitch or the thread profile and they also show how to grind a matching d-bit for this operation pictures from a trade show with a decal fp2lb it seems machining what looks like the base casting of decal s1 tool and cutter grinder this is definitely the casting of my tool and cutter grinder um, this is sad this doesn't exist anymore this is a eight millimeter short film about the application on boring and grinding with the decal lk machines this was a 20 minute movie on sorry 16 millimeter film about the application of this machine but it doesn't seem to be to exist anymore i looked around i asked people and nobody ever has heard or seen it it appears the cutaway poster of the Deckel FP1 there are a bunch of them around but hard to get back then blazing high-tech digital readout with glass scales on one of the LKB machines on the chick borer machines And they also just gave general tips and tricks using the microscope to align work using indicators to align your work or using dial indicator here on the copy milling machine because picking up workpiece origins on a copy milling machine is, is not that trivial uh, you have to consider some things there is another one of these um, hodgepodge releases using the Deckel S1 grinder to grind back relieved form cutters line boring on a Deckel FP2LB machine 
with a very long boring bar work pieces in here in a fixture and the boring bar goes through here and is put on this steady rest which is mounted on the table and even has a little oiler on top here to keep the boring bar lubricated and even more details the boring bar as you can see goes into this this guide block then they even put a sleeve over here so when the boring bar passes through the pillow block uh, nobody gets catched on the boring bar and sucked into the machine which is always a situation to be avoided this this setup only works that way with the pillow block mounted to the table because on the lkb machine on because on the lb machines the column moves and the work is stationary this this was an interesting idea they put an indexing disk on the x-axis of the mill to to be able to move the table and define increment if you had to drill a hole every 17 millimeters you could make a custom indexing disk for that and put that on the x-axis and do your linear increments that way I found this interesting. This is a steady rest for working with extremely long D bits with a shoe supporting the D bit on its smooth shank, which is one of the advantages of a D bit because it has a, a solid straight shank, which is in itself very rigid, but it also allows you to support it with, with a steady rest. And this is what the idea was to use this on the copy milling machines. As you can see here, it's mounted to the spindle and supports the side of the d-bit on this length here or up here is, is the steady rest for the cutter and supporting the d-bit going down into this very deep cavity quite neat and here they fixed the lineup fp1 to 3 which the 3 is already in, by 1970s the normal layout and the FP33 with its weird slant bed configuration has been renamed and moved into a different category. FP3L which is a, a, the lighter version of this and then they added FP4 I think they have a picture here yes FP4 is quite a massive manual milling machine they also later did an FP4M which was a very well liked machine. These are quite, quite heavy duty machines. And again, a ton of application pictures using the, <laughs> using the two axis high speed head or the, the right angle attachment. By this point, the right angle head was not an entire separate head anymore. It was an attachment that slid over the quill of the machine. using the large rotary table to machine this weird shaped casting. So these, these machines were really, really big. As you can see here, they're working on a, I think it's a turbine part. They usually had a little text. Yeah, it's a, a turbine part. We're on a 560 millimeter rotary table, double swivel variant using the right angle head again. Which is really, really large workpiece, and uh, you don't want to mess that up. This is, I always like this picture. This is a Deckel FP3L with the stationary table and a workpiece with a diameter of. 58 inches. This was sent in from a company in the UK, I think. Uh, and they have this huge aluminium ring with all these bores and it, they are using a slitting saw to slit all these bores as shown by this drawing here. There's a, a thread and a, a hole to clamp these, these holes. Uh, what's interesting how it is held there are three rollers in here bolted against an angle plate and then they just have these two 
strap clamps holding the part once it is indexed and they have some kind of an indexing pin mounted to a small adjustable angle table here indexing in those holes so that's quite the that's quite the involved setup here but what i find interesting is really the three roll of support here to to create uh, a bearing situation where you can spin the work on Deckel G1L, a uh, lovely machine. Using the Deckel FP1 as a ball turner, using um, the boring head in the indexing head, which allows you to spin it like on a ball turner. And you put the workpiece in the machine spindle, and then you can do ball turning. So, yeah, this is an endless supply of interesting little tidbits spiral milling was always big in these uh, publications grinding a spherical pocket with the work on an angle with the planetary jig grinding head and rotating the work This is a chapter about slotting because they also made a slotting head for the machine and again with practical examples with the slotting head, slotting head at an angle, you're working in a casting, also doing extremely fine slotting work on something like an EDM electrode. That was back then uh, an example that they choose very often, either doing slotting on very, very fragile and thin um, punches for tool and die work, or also for EDM electrodes in copper. Uh, cutting internal square and hex shape, or doing internal splines, or uh, toothed couplers. They also showed uh, commercial available accessories that make sense like, well, screw jacks, or spindle extensions so you could reach into large castings if you needed to work in deeper or to raise work on the indexing head higher up so you can reach them with the horizontal spindle which is sometimes a problem this is funky this is the, the <laughs> let's look at this picture there is a lot going on you have the universal toolmaker table which was available for the larger machines this is a swivel tilt and rotary table but it is a real rotary table built into it with indexing disc and uh, dial then they have a, a small xy table on top of the, of the of the rotary table to move the work around and realign the center of rotation of the work piece this was later replaced by the punch milling attachment that i have so this was the makeshift version of that. Then they have the slotting head on the machine with a tiny slotting tool on here, probably to work on this tiny punch on here. And they even have a microscope on, on the slide of the, of the slotting head, which means that the microscope will go up and down with the slotting head uh, to inspect the work on the table here. Quite interesting. And as, as I mentioned before, the, the mill had just tilted and pushed back. So that was a lot going on here. Here, it, oh, here it is. Here is the the punch milling attachment or XY slide that I have that I mentioned replaced later uh, this makeshift version here. So this has the two axes to to move the work to a new center of rotation. I'm just browsing through here and when I see something interesting I'm stopping. Um, here, is, uh, here is a chapter about boring, using boring heads in different variants, like uh, UPA4 on the FP33 machine. Guy looks very confident. I would look that confident if I ran this machine too. Um, using the small UPA1 boring head and the right angle head to machine uh, 
a channel with a radius going this direction or this direction. A precision boring head on a Dekel FP1 with the riser block. This riser block is a little bit tricky to get. And of course horizontal boring using a small diameter boring head in the horizontal spindle of this machine to machine this casting. They probably did one side and then rotate the table 180 degrees to the other side. They show different hole inspection tools like uh, tri-mic and a dial bore gauge, but also tooling to measure and check the tool bit on line boring bars that don't have a micrometer adjustment. So uh, these are shop made by, by the looks of it, but it, as if you were a machine inspector and you saw this and uh, then you thought, oh, I can make that myself. So, uh, and here again, the ball turning, ball turning um, ideas that they had. Could, al could also be done with the with vertical spindle and then you could even do a ball shape with a tapered transition to a shank with the head tilted. Note that they are using the indexing head here on the table and it's hanging off the back of the table quite a bit. Uh, this, this was a nice idea. Uh, I want to build this at some point. This is a steady rest for the indexing head for work that you cannot use with a with the tail stock of the indexing head because you need to do end work like here with a slitting saw. A slitting saw, very thin and the workpiece is held down here in the indexing head and then you have a steady rest with a v-block holding the work steady so it doesn't squirm around with whatever you do with the saw up here. Or uh, supporting the back of this very thin punch up here while using a D-bit to do something on it. So, um, and that's a case where they provided a full set of drawings and some ideas how to build it. Building an automatic feed system when using the slotting head, they added a, a Bowden Bowden cable that was actuated by the slotting head and then they had a ratchet and palm mechanism on the x-axis or on the rotary table to get power feed for the slotting head because you cannot use the machine power feed with the slotting head because it's not synchronized to the upper and lower uh, dead end position of the slotting head but with this addition it would work. Oh, and here they even had a plan for a small direct indexing head. Complete set of drawings to go either on the table of the milling machine directly, on the apron or on the end of the, of the, of the stock indexing head so you didn't have to change a lot around when you just wanted to do a cross hole. Oh, yeah, that's it. That, that's the Deckel technical bulletins. Oh, and also. So uh, the, the silver play button came in. It, interestingly enough, you have to, you, you get a, a request code for it once the channel reaches 100,000 subscribers, and then you can order the button your exclusive button because they make about half a million of these a year or something like that and gets gets thrown into your carport once it is done. Um, well, I, hook, I, I hang it up because, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's kind of a milestone. So thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed this rather short episode. Thanks for the support and I'll be back.